Hey, there we go. That's a little better. Hey, I want to lean in. All right, we go. We're going to lean in now. We had fun. We're going to keep having fun all day, but right here, this is why we are here, to receive something from the Word of God. That's why we praise, because God has got something in store for you. So we're going to lean into a message I got for you today. This is probably one of my favorite messages to preach. And there may be a couple of you that maybe you were at NYC or something a couple years ago. You're like, I heard this word, but I feel like God is ready for me to bring this to you this morning. So I need everybody right now to say, even if. Even if. Everybody in the room say, even if. Daniel chapter 3. Some of you heard this story plenty of times, but there's some things in it that I want you to catch today. So Daniel chapter 3, it says this in verses 16 through 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. For if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from it your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Even if he does not show up, we will still not bow down to the culture that's around us. We will still not bow down to the idol that's there before us that you built. But the promise that's there is if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from it. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment today as we lean in. I'm going to pray for us, and you're going to be able to make your way back to your seat in just a second. But some of you are in a moment right now in your life that you feel like every day you are walking into a blazing furnace. Some of you are in a, in a moment in your life where you're like, I just wish God would just take it out, take me out right now. Some of you even thought, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do it. I'm going to take, take myself out. Because I am not sure if God is going to show up. I promise you, God is faithful in his word and he is always there with you. But we're going to take moments over the next 24 hours, and we're going to lean in. So with no one looking around today, heads bowed, eyes closed, I want to do this. Before we get into the word, before we get into an invitation, we do this a lot on Wednesday night. But, again, no one looking around. If you're saying right now, I, I am struggling. I've got thoughts that I shouldn't have. I look at stuff that I shouldn't be looking at, and I can't stop. I'm doing things that I shouldn't be doing. And it's just, it's just there. It's the pattern of my life. It's the rhythm that I am. You got depression that's overwhelming. You got anxiety you can't even walk out your front door. You got something that's weighing on your chest so heavy that you don't even know if God is there. If you would just slip your hand up right now and just put it right back down. I got you. No looking around. No looking around. I got hands. I got hands. I got hands. Students, leaders, doesn't matter who you are. Just put your hand up. Put it right back. You got something that you got to deal with. God, I thank you. God, that we get to be here. God, that your word is alive. It's true. It's active. It's relevant every single day. But God, right now, I pray that you make yourself known to every single one of these students and leaders in this room. God, I pray right now that this word would be a deposit that comes from you. God, and I just get to speak what you've laid on my heart. God, I thank you for these leaders. I thank you for these students. God, whatever it is that they are walking through right now, whether it's the depression that's leading to suicidal thoughts, the anxiety that weighs on their heart where they can't make friends and just beats in their chest till it feels like their heart's going to come out of it. God, it's the insecurity of what is everybody else going to think about me. It's the devalue of people around saying that you're not worth anything. You'll never amount to anything. God, whatever it is that is, that keeps stumbling over, God. God, begin to make yourself present and known in this moment that you have something great for them as they lean into you. Father, I thank you, we praise you, and we give you the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Do me a favor, high five three people, get back to your seat. High five three people, get back to your seat. 
One, two, three, high fives. One, two, three, high fives. One, two, three, high fives. Good deal, good deal, good deal. When you're in your seat, give me a yeah. When you're in your seat, give me a yeah. All right, repeat after me. Say amen. amen. Say that's good. All right. We're going to, I want you, I want to hear from you today. We're going to lean in. Uh, someone spilled a water bottle up here. That's good. Can I get right here with you guys for a second? We go with that. So here's what I want to do. I want to, I want to take this time as I, as I get in uh, to what God's going to share, but I want to do something specific for a second. Like we are here to do this because we are passionate about your generation because it's not just that you're going to make an impact in the future, but you make a significant impact and influence right now every single day. So I want to make sure that you kind of catch what some of the pieces are that make this kind of happen. And there's all kinds of people across this room that volunteer. There's people that drove you from all over the, the region to be here. They, they, they answer your late phone calls. They pick you up when you got in trouble. They wait late for you at church. All kinds of different things because they're passionate about watching God do what only God can do in your life. But here's the deal. God can only do what God can do if you open your heart to him. Because Jesus is a gentleman. It says he waits at the door, waiting and knocking, waiting on you to let him in. Hey, I'm right here. I got you. If you would just let me be with you in this moment, I got a plan for you. What everybody else says about you doesn't matter. Just let me in and let me change your life. But it's when you open the door and let them into your heart that it actually begins to transpire and you begin to change. And there's people in here that are passionate and excited about what God's going to do in your life, whether it's something that happened last night or it's this morning or it's this evening or it's tomorrow morning or it's a couple weeks later in church or it's two years from now. Well, they are here for you. So I want to do this for just a second, okay? I want to show you what this dynamic looks like. Sebastian, will you come up here? Mo, will you come up here? Sam, come up here real quick. Um, I got y'all. Let me see. Um, Preston. Preston or Tyler, one of you. Preston, come here. Okay. Preston, let's see here. Uh, Peace, come on. Is PV, if PV is somewhere close, he can come up real quick too. Um, let's see. Miss Lynn, you come up here. Miss Susan, will you come here real quick, please? Got a few of you. I want you to show you just kind of this, this dynamic, Okay. I had something significant happen this year. Something significant. I turned 30. I turned, <laughs> shut your mouth. Mark's gonna be like, dang, I turned 30. I turned 30, and I thought this was gonna be like this. I'm turning 30 years old. It was gonna be something ridiculous, something crazy. You're good, yeah, you're good, you're good. Come on, you're good, yeah. But my heart is for your generation. If you guys would recognize the influence, the impact that you could have, because uh, Jesus said to go into all the world, and that has never been more accessible or more available than it is right now. The platform you can build, the influence you can have if you lean into that. So real quick, I'm going to do this. So you, you, and you are 20, 21, that kind of age frame right there, all right? 19, 20, 20, 21 doing significant things. I know some of them are like, oh, you're really going to do this? Doing significant things for the kingdom. Preston, how old are you? 34. All right. Peace right here and Pastor Vince, they actually went to high school together. All right. I want 40s, okay? We'll just put decades in that wind frame. So, Miss Lynn, what's the... 58, okay? Miss Susan... Miss Susan is 76. And you know what? They could have been a lot of places this weekend and done a lot of things. But they are for you. They are for you. 
We're honored and blessed in, in this to have a lead pastor that says, hey, if it's going to impact our region, our church, our community, our students, let's make it happen. So when you begin to look around, you guys catch a lot of flack for being a generation that's disrespectful, right? Well, it just doesn't come by nature. Someone taught that. Someone showed you that it was okay to do that to the generations before you. We're going to shift some of those things. So I want you to do me a favor in this moment, whether it's your youth pastor that's around you, it's a leader, it's a volunteer, whoever that might be, would you give it up for every generation and every decade that's represented and here that's making these things happen for every single one of you? And I need you to do me a favor at some point. Say thank you over the next, not right now, you can say right now, but like, when we walk out of the room over the next few hours sometime or today, say thank you. Show gratitude. Because, they, again, they could have been a lot of other stuff they could have been doing. Your youth pastor, your youth leader didn't have to be here today. They didn't have to bust you over. They didn't have to load you up, be calling me, making all the logistic things happen. They want to see God do incredible things in your life. Because we've been in rooms like this and we've seen things happen and the reason they get to stand right here is because there was a generation before them that said, I believe in you and I am for you because I have watched God change life after life after life and he's not done yet. No matter what the world around us, no matter what culture says, God is still moving. But be a generation that's ready to step into the movement of God. Do me, give, me, give me some honor. Give me a clap, a shout, a praise for them one more time. Thank you, guys. So y'all go grab it. So you'll get to hang out with them all day and some collabs and stuff like that here in a, here in a little bit. But I want to lean in to, uh, to this word for a moment. So if you got your notebook, you got a phone, you take notes on, only take notes on the phone. Don't do anything else on it right now. But pull out your journal, put it in your way. Even if, even if. Even if, say it with me, even if. You guys like movies? Who's gone to see the Barbie movie? Don't answer that. <laughs> There's a lot of dudes' hands going up. I'm just saying. But I like movies. And this is like a dynamic in our house that uh, my wife really doesn't like movies. She's like, they're a waste of time. They're boring and all. I'm like, I, I, like, you go to bed. I'll go to the movies. Like, I like watching movies. My, Beck, my four-year-old, he's like, can we go to the movies? So, like, we're, we're going to see Mario Kart. We're going to see the Ninja Turtles. We're going to see, like, the new one that he loves, Sharks. He's obsessed with sharks. He was a shark for Halloween last year. And a couple months ago, I was like, hey, what do you want to be for Halloween this year? He's like, a shark. I'm like, you were a shark last year. I'm like, I, daddy, I love sharks. I was like, okay, I get it, but you were a shark last year. So we went the other night, we went to go see, uh, we went to go see the Mario, no, we went to go see Spider-Man. Anybody see Spider-Man yet? New Spider-Verse movie? So we went to go see that. I got a whole lot deeper than I expected to get for my four-year-old. But we went to go see Spider-Man and we walk in and usually he's all about the popcorn, but he didn't want popcorn that night. He's like, I just want to get to the movie. I was like, okay, cool. But then we stopped because he saw a poster. And the poster was for a movie that's coming out that's called Meg 2. <laughs> so it's the Megalodon. And he's like, can we go see the shark movie? And I was like, I don't think you're going to go get to see that shark movie. But we'll watch Shark Week this week. How's that sound? And he's like, I really want to see the shark movie. I was like, well, we'll make it work. We're not going to go see Meg 2, but we'll find something shark for him to watch. But I, I love movies. But a lot of times when it comes to the, how people write the movie, they start at the end and they work backwards. They get the ending that they want to see to transpire and they begin to work backwards from there. What are some of the movies that you guys, you guys seen Titanic? It's like, Jack, Jack, come back. Like, girl, you could have fit him on that piece of wood. Like, we, we all know he would have fit, right? One of my favorites growing up was always, it was, it was Rocky, the Rocky movies. Like, if you really want to get juiced and get ready to go and take on the world, watch some of the Rocky movies. Yo, Adrian! Good movies. Some of you are like, I don't know what you're talking about. Get a VHS player and go watch them. They're on Netflix. Even better. Go watch them. Wasn't it like Lion King? You guys like Lion King? Scar might be the worst villain ever. Like, homeboy literally killed his brother and blamed it on his nephew. Like, that's bad. So, so Lion King, good movies. 
And a lot of them start at the end and they work backwards. If you begin to look at your life at the end and work backwards, there's a lot of things that would look different in your life. Because just like I said a minute ago, God has already made a way for you to have victory in whatever you are facing if you begin to let him lead you through it. You see, there's a thing called the cross in Calvary. And Jesus Christ came to this earth and he walked this earth and he was perfect, faultless, blameless, tempted, tried every single thing that you experience in the world face today. He was tempted with it. Fully man, fully God. I thought it was great last night when John was like, hey, if, if, if he would have jumped, he would have broke his legs, he would have broke his back, he would have broke his neck, and he would have died, and there would have been no resurrection. Man, some things just click sometimes. He's fully man, he was fully God. So if he jumps off the top of that building, yeah, he could save himself, but at the same time, he's fully man, and if that happens, we're not here today. But he walked this earth and he knew there was going to come a moment where they were going to beat him. They were going to mock him and they were going to crucify him. They were going to take a whip filled with bones that were sharpened and glass shards and all these things. And that whip would be actually thrown across him where it would wrap around his body and would latch on this side. And as it ripped, it would rip the flesh off of the bone so significantly that you could actually see through him. A crown of thorns placed on his head, mocking him as he was the king of kings. He was the king of the Jews. And the whole time he did this because he knew that he was going to be the final sacrifice for everything that you walk through, that you carry, that you do for ultimate forgiveness, redemption, and freedom. And the making a way for a victory in that if you would recognize the victory. You see, not only did he die upon a cross, but three days later, he rose again and he ascended into heaven. And he has a promise that one day he will return. And he fulfills his promises. So if it says that God is good and God is faithful and God is here and present in your life, then that, present, that promise reigns true and he will return. And until that day comes that he returns, we're to do all that we can to draw closer and closer to him and share the gospel with those around us so that heaven may increase and, del and hell would decrease. You see, he, he actually went, he conquered death and he defeated the grave and he went to hell and he brought the keys back. When the enemy thought that he had him, Jesus said, no, no, I got a bigger plan. And that made a victory and it made a way for every single one. So in these moments that we lean into for a second, if you will begin to recognize in your life that you have victory in whatever you face, when you let God begin to lead you through it, it will change your perspective because you are an eternal being. You're not just here for a moment. You're not just here for a weekend. You're not just here for the lifespan that looks like this in the span of eternity. God has created you for an eternal purpose, and that is to worship and glorify him for all of eternity. And he wants that for you. Say, even if. There's some significant moments in history where people cried out in distress. God, I, I don't know what else to do. I don't know where I'm at. I don't know what's taking place. I don't know why I'm here. But they cried out and it was a significant moment that changed the world around them. One of the most famous ones that you'll lean into is Martin Luther King and it was the, I have a dream speech. And a lot of people think that Martin Luther King was like this, he was a super influential person, but they think he was this wealthy guy that had all this stuff. And no, he was, he was a local pastor. He was a preacher. But God impressed it on his heart that he's going to lead people. So in this moment where the people that were around him were oppressed and they were broken and they were hurting, he walked out and he said, I have a dream. And it changed the culture that we see today. Not that it's perfect. We still got stuff. But then there was also a moment on that day at Calvary where Jesus said, it is finished. It is finished. And in that moment, he fulfilled the promise where when 
in the garden where Adam and Eve sinned for the first time in the fall took place and the things that you face now and the questions about death and the doubts that you have and the depression and the, the discouragement and all these things that we were never supposed to understand or experience crept in. And God said, that's not the creation I intended for my people to experience. He said, it is finished so that you might have eternal life. So we lean into these guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three dudes, they were, they were teenagers. They were Hebrew boys that were captured and taken into the Babylonian culture. And so there, God actually showed favor upon them in this season. Everyone say favor. In a place that they were pulled out of. And they weren't supposed to be. And it was totally different than the culture that they were used to and that they lived in. They continually met with God and led in that and said, God, what are you going to do in my life? How are you going to use me in this culture, in this society I am in to make a difference? You see, the world that we live in and the culture that you face every single day is not the world and the culture that was intended for us to experience. And that culture and that world is out to get you. It may look good, it may feel good, it may seem good in the moment, but I can promise you the enemy is the greatest liar and deceiver of all time and his only goal is to take you out and finish you so that you cannot step into the purpose that God has for you. Oh, I don't even know what purpose is. I don't know why I exist. We said it last night. God has put eternity on your heart. Ask him why you're here. Walk it out. What's my, what's my position? What's my influence? What can I do? Where can I go? And so in this, we think a lot of times the world we live in is awful, and it is. It's not, it's not all sunshine and rainbows, you know. But Babylon was the most godless society that there was. And so they didn't only come out of being God's people and be captivated and taken in, into being prisoners into this world, into this country, this culture. But it was a godless society. And so King Nebuchadnezzar, he, you know, you built this statue and said, all these people, you have, when, this, when this music begins to play, we're going to bow at the statue. If you watch, you know, someone tell me, you watch VeggieTales, what is it? Some of you, let's see, the, what, what, is, what is it that you bow down to in VeggieTales? Preston, someone help me. No! You don't know the veggie, The chocolate bunny! Man, we might have to have a movie tonight and watch some Veggie Tales. If that is not a cultural, like generational gap, then I don't know what is. You guys need to watch some Veggie Tales, okay? So in Veggie Tales, they, they bow down and worship this chocolate bunny, but it was actually this huge statue of gold. And so then we get to this moment. So these guys, they, they've been faithful and they've honored the authority around them, and they've actually been put into a position where they were advisors to the king. And he let them have a little bit of slack in the middle. They said, hey, King, here's the deal. Like, we're, we're not going to worship your God. Like, w w we have our God, and he is the God, the only God. And we're going to worship him. And, and because he had them in a place of influence, he was like, okay, well, I'll, let you, I'll let you do that. But you know, like, people get weird about stuff pretty quick, don't they? And they change their mind pretty quick, too, don't you? You guys ever had a friend change your mind? You guys ever had a parent change your mind? We won't talk about that. <laughs> but here's the deal. He changed his mind. He said, no, you guys are going to bow. They're like, no, no, here's the deal. We actually have to eat our own diet too. Like we're not supposed to eat certain things. And so they pressed in and he said, okay, whatever. Like let, let them do what they got to do. They're facing their biggest challenge. And in life right now, you may be facing your biggest challenge that you face. I don't care what age you are. Whatever challenge you are facing is probably the biggest challenge you've ever faced. There's other things that will come in life. There's other things that you'll experience. There's other things that you'll see. But the thing that is evident and blocking you right now is probably the biggest challenge that you're facing. But in the biggest challenge that you face is also your opportunity to make your biggest stand. And the biggest challenge you face is the opportunity for you to make the biggest stand. And so they begin to take a stand. 
Our God can, our good God will, and he does save. God of gods, Lord of lords, King is that creator of heaven and earth. The things that you get to see around us. It's not just black and white. It's not just stale, but there's tones and there's textures. He went above and beyond to give you the creation and the experience that he intended for you to have. He breathes stars into existence and he knows them by name. Number of hairs on your head, the decision that you're going to make and that decision you're going to make, but yet he still loves you and died for you. Can you lean in for me for just a second? Oh, I like it. I like it. He created you for a purpose. I hope you catch that. Before you even thought about, before you were even considered, for whatever transpired for you to be thought about to come into this world, God said, I have your name, I have your purpose, I have your plan. But again, it's up to us to step into that. He's made a way. So how do I get there? Because, man, Aaron, have you, like, even if moments, I can tell you, I've been in moments there was even if. And I didn't want to be in those moments that were even if. There was a season. Some of you know this story and some of you don't, but I'm going to lean into it for a second. Nine months before I was born, I was at church. My dad was our pastor. Okay. So I grew up going to church every single day. Uh, we went to a great church when I was in third grade. He planted a church, uh, saw great things happen at that church, actually merged with another church, which you don't see a whole lot. You often see church splits, but you don't see a lot of church mergers. And so I was born, or I was, I was born again. I was saved. I prayed that prayer of salvation when I was in first grade after watching an episode of Walker, Texas Ranger. Chuck Norris, baby, bam, kicked the devil in his face that day. But I went through life knowing that God had a plan for my life. And I did my best, just as some of you do your best. Didn't always do it perfect. Made some mistakes along the way, had great parents. And about ninth grade, God really began to lean into me, really pressing me on this this call to ministry, whatever that was going to look like. And I didn't want it. I didn't want anything to do with it. My mom and dad, they don't really have friends. All their friends are just pretty shallow and fake and not real because they got to think they got to be something when they're around them because of church. People are people and they leave church and they come back and forth and they hurt people and they say vile things and all this. Just like the things that some of you say to your friends or some of the things that they say to you, grown ups say a lot worse things. And I watched this and I watched them lead and I watched them encourage and I watched them be faithful to the call that God put on their lives. But I saw also moments that were miserable and I didn't want that. But God said, no, I got something for you. I got something for you. I got something for you. And I said, I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't want it. I didn't, I didn't do the party thing. I was blessed with a group of friends that we didn't have to do that. Um, I did like the attention of girls. I'm not going to lie about that. But, but I got the good one, and she's sitting right over there. But here's the deal. Ninth grade, 10th grade, wrestling. We went on this trip. Just There was... Me and two other kids from our youth group and our youth pastors went out to California. We did a little bit of mission projects and leadership stuff. And they, they, they intentionally picked me, not because I was the pastor's kid, because they knew there was something that God was leaning into me for. And I didn't want it. I just wanted to go to California. Like, I hadn't been on a plane before. Like, I live in a town of 300 people. I've never been on a plane. I want to get on a plane. Let's go. Let's see what Cali's like. And it wasn't, it wasn't pretty. We didn't go to the pretty part of California. We went and God was still there and I got something for you. God, I don't want it. God, I don't want it. Jump ahead another year going into my junior year, August of 2009, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. 
You're like, yeah, that sucks. It's hard. Yeah. I didn't really know how to process it, how to handle it. Didn't really take it in as something significant because about a month later, all of a sudden my dad is like, hey, I'm moving out. Hold on. You're our pastor. You're my dad. Like, this doesn't make sense to anything fast. So moved out, got to a hotel room for a couple of weeks. And then one of my friends one night, she was te- we were texting and she goes, hey, what's this about your dad and... I'm not going to leave names. I'm not going to say names, but, but your dad and so-and-so having an affair. Like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. So I texted one of my other friends and I said, hey, Marcus, what's this about? I got about my dad sleeping around and he didn't respond. He didn't say anything. He called my mom and said, hey, Aaron's asking questions that I'm not going to answer. You need to have friends in your life that are more mature than the friends that you have so that they can handle situations that you're not prepared to handle sometimes. Because I can promise you there are plenty of situations you're walking through right now you don't know how to handle. So I texted Marcus and I didn't get an answer that night. Went to school the next day, mind is spinning, it's racing. I'm not talking to anybody, I'm not like, we're just here. Get home that night, walk in, my dad's like, we gotta talk. So he walked me through it. What happened? It happened one time. All this stuff. And man, I was, I was hot. I yelled as loud as I could yell. I kicked, I screamed. I ran out the front door, ran out the front door. I got to my car. I was ready to take off and fly out of there. My mom grabbed me and said, no, you're coming back in the house because you're not leaving anywhere right now because you're going to do something dumb. Whether it's drive too fast and get in a wreck because you're not paying attention or it's to go find somewhere or find something. Like you're going to do something dumb and you're staying right here because we're going to walk through this all together. And so for the next nine months, I was the most inconsiderate, disrespectful Christian towards my father that I possibly could be. He messed up. Okay. We all mess up. Mess up daily. I was doing some dumb stuff in there. But you know what? It was okay for me to do dumb stuff, but the dumb stuff that he did, no, you're my dad, you're my pastor, you're my leader. But no, now you're not who I thought you were. And that call to ministry, God, you can forget about that. Because this is what it does to people. Mm, I'm out. It's pretty low. I don't want to be at church. I was, I've been at church enough, and now I don't have to go. I don't want to be at church. Jump ahead to June of 2010. My mom goes to go visit some family and spend a week over there with her brother and, and uh, their, their wives and nieces and nephews and stuff. And she left on a Sunday night, was coming back on Friday. I stayed at one of my friend's house so that I could work uh, my summer job at PacSun and blow my paycheck and play golf. But Tuesday morning, I woke up and my mom was at the foot of my bed. And I said, Mom, what are you doing? She said, Aaron, your dad's gone. He's, He's not here anymore. He took his own life last night. Man. Not only did my life change... 10 months prior to that. But in that moment, there was no turning back. Can't fix anything now. Can't do anything different now. God, that call to ministry now is the last thing on my radar on that Tuesday morning. But God did what only God can do. And even if, even if he doesn't show up, I can promise you he will show up. So that night, drove drove back to the house that morning, and that night, in our backyard, around a fire pit with about 40 friends, we had church. We worshiped, we sang, we prayed, and we leaned in. And if God is faithful in that lowest moment 
then I can promise you he'll be faithful in the one that you're facing right now. You see, you look at your adult leader right now and some of those, you don't know what I'm facing, you don't know what I'm walking through, you have no idea what someone else's story is. The generation that's 80 years old, the one that's 60 years old, the one that's 40 years old, the one that's 20 years old, the ones in the room that are 15. No one generation is better than the one that's before, but we got to lean in and we got to listen to each other. Because there are things that you can learn. Because if I didn't have those people around me that said, hey, in this moment right now where, where life sucks and we're all hurting, we're going to worship and we're going to declare that God is good. Even if, even if, it took a radical moment in my life right there for me to start looking and doing things different. And here's the deal. I don't, I don't want you to have to get to a crossroads in a moment in your life where it's like, God, I have nowhere else to go because my dad's gone. That rock, that consistency, because they're gone. Because of a loss, because of a mistake, I want you to be able to step into a spot right now where you're like, God, before anything gets crazy, I want you to begin to work in my heart and work in my life. There's going to be seasons that it's still even if. Change doesn't start in the White House. It doesn't start in your school district. It doesn't start with your teachers. It doesn't start with your parents in your house. It starts with your house right here. That's where change starts. You want to see change take place around you? Begin to watch God change what's in you. And that'll change the people and the things that are around you. So how do I get there? How do I get there? Parents, leaders in the room in this moment, just for a second, you're not going to understand some of the stuff that these kids face. Because you never even had to think about some of the stuff that they face. But the Bible says to raise them up in the way that which they should go. Not the way that you went. Not the way that you're going. But to be led by the Holy Spirit to take them in the direction that God is leading them. So when something happens and you're really angry and you're mad at them and you don't understand why, rather than looking at them face and going, why? I don't understand. Look at them and say, why? I don't understand. Let me walk with you. Let me be here for you. I don't want to just be mad at you in this moment, but I want to watch God lead you through this. Because even if, even if he doesn't show up, our God is still good. So how do I get there? How do I get to this even if? The first thing you got to do, we got these three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The first thing you got to do is you got to stand. You got to stand. If you don't stand, let's back it up. Sometimes it's hard to stand. So sometimes before you stand, actually, you got to sit. You got to sit. So these guys, they were tight. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You want to know who they were? These guys, they had specific names. They meant something. I'm going to give you a little glimpse of, of who they were. Bow down to this statue. Shadrach was like the bold one. He was like the super Christian. You got, got a friend or maybe you're the one that's like the super Christian. Like, I'm not afraid of nothing. God's got me. I'm here. I believe that God's for me. He's done something significant in my life. And so I don't care anything around me. But in this moment, I'm going to lead. I'm going to encourage people who are looking at me. Meshach was like the barely saved one. He was kind of hood. And so he was the one that was like, hey, I know God's got me because I know what I used to be. So why don't you try me? Like, come at me. You want the smoke? I'll give you the smoke. Like, come, come for me, okay? And then Abednego, he was pretty timid. 
he was shy, he was bashful, he was kind of uncertain. He was like, guys, maybe uh, maybe this isn't like uh, the thing that we should do. Maybe we should just kind of, mm, uh, maybe just like, can we just like bow a little bit or something like that, make someone happy? And the other two were like, no, nah, bro, we're going to take them out. And then Shadrach's like, no, we're not going to take anybody out today. Like we're actually going to stand because God is good and what he's called us to. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their, their names meant something. So now they're faced in this season where Remember Nebuchadnezzar, the king, he changed his mind. He let him get away with it for a little bit, but then there came a moment that one day he said, you know what, I've had enough. You guys aren't bowing down. You're not doing what I asked you to do. Everybody else is cool with it, but I've had enough. So I'm going to throw you into the furnace. And I wish I would have grabbed a picture of it because there's this really cool AI page on Instagram that has like Bible imageries and stuff that's generated by AI, but I didn't do it. And these guys, they were in this thing together. They sat together. They prayed together. They ate together. They did life together. Some of you are in a season of life that you cannot stand for anything because you're sitting with the wrong people. And sometimes you're sitting with the wrong people at church and sometimes you're sitting with the wrong people at school and sometimes there's going to be seasons that God is going to put people around you that you are going to sit with, but there are going to be some seasons that maybe you're going to sit alone for just a couple moments so God can get you in the right place at the right time. But who are you choosing to sit with? Because we could preach it all day long and you've probably heard it three times already this summer as you show me your friends and I'll show you your future. But who are you sitting with? And what is the voice that they're speaking into you? And what are the things that they're encouraging you to do? Or what are the the, the direction that they're trying to take you? And I loved it last night. False realities, fake friends, false futures. Who are you sitting with? Because there's going to become a moment that, yes, you sit Man, that lunch table, it's an awkward place, isn't it? Especially if you're at a new school. Who am I going to sit with? Where am I going to go? Because like, that means a lot because I get a label from this thing. Who you sit with matters. But once you know who you sit with and there comes a moment to take a stand, you have to stand. The obedience of following what God has for you. You have to stand. You know, it would have been a whole lot easier on these guys if they would have just bowed. No one would have thought anything different. No one probably would have questioned them if they even believed. Because the fruits before them said that they were different. But in this moment, they said, no, no, no. We are going to stand. That statue, that idol, that is not our God. And so why I'm going to stand for my God And so in this moment, they stood. And here's the deal. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for absolutely everything that's around you. So what are you standing for? What is it that you are going to make a difference in? What is it that God's calling you? What is it God that's put in you to make a difference and influence those around you? What is it that you're good at? Ask God, why am I good at this? So that I might take a stand. You have to sit and you have to stand. You cannot do different alone, and you got to know where you're taking a stand. So you know what happened in this? And they took a stand, and Nebuchadnezzar was like, hey, here's the deal. I'm tired of it. I'm sick of it. That furnace, turn it up seven times hotter than it's ever been before, and we're going to throw them in there. And that's where we get this text right here. They say, do it. Go for it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, we do not need to defend ourselves for you in this matter. So many of you in your life are trying, spending way too much try, time trying to defend yourself when God is already in the middle of the battle for you if you would let him. Get out of his way and let God do what only God can do. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. You got to stand. You got to stand. 
What are you doing every single day so you're prepared for the moment that you have to take a stand? We well, listened to it last night. If Jesus was tempted, I can promise you there's going to be a moment that you're tempted coming up. Because the enemy's goal is to take you out. Not trip you up, not make you stumble, not distract you. No, to kill you, destroy you, take you out. So what are you doing in private that'll make you look different in public? What are you looking at in private? What are you spending time in in private? Are you reading? Are you studying? Are you worshiping? Are you making time for God so when the moment comes to go public and to stand, you're ready for it? Or is it whenever God says, hey, I need you to do this, you're like, I am not ready for it. And you got a different response you have to give because you haven't been spending time with God in order to take a stand. The next thing is this. You sit, you stand, you walk. Even if, you know what's crazy about the furnace in this moment? Turned it up seven times hotter. You know how hot that is? It's hotter than what it's going to be outside today. This is how hot it was. Not only were they going to go into the furnace, but in this furnace that was turned up seven times hotter, when they got to it, the guards that were going to lead them into the furnace actually died before they even got to the door of it. That's how hot it was. You know what that means? That these boys, they had a chance to bolt and run. They could have dipped. They said, okay, well, the furnace is open. We don't have to do this. The guards are gone. We got to get out of here. We're free to go. But even if, so you know what they did? They walked into the furnace. So they walked into the thing that was ultimately probably going to kill them. There are going to be things in your life that God is saying that you need to take a stand for that is going to feel like it's going to kill you. And it's going to be hard. But if you have the idea, the mentality, the mindset, God, even if, because I know you've been there, I know you're here, I don't know, I'm just going to walk. Even if I'm going to step and watch because you know what's really cool is those Babylonian guards there that were of that world. He took them out and they stepped into the furnace. And when they stepped into the furnace, that's where God showed up. He took out the worldly thing that was around them. And in that furnace, when they stepped in, God showed up. So they sat together, they stood together, they walked together. And the last thing is this, get the right label. I know who I am because I am a child of God. Remember those Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those were their Babylonian names. Those were not their God-given names. That's not who they were. That was the identity that the world placed on them. Can we get real for a second? A lot of you in the room today, are living an identity that was your world-given name and not what God has identified you as. Can I get real? Can we, get, can we catch some smoke for a second? Are we good with that? Some of you are living every single day with the identity that you're dumb because someone said that. You're living with the identity that that you're a pothead, you're a druggie, you're a slut, you sleep around because of some of the choices that you have made. You're living with the identity that you're lazy and you'll never amount to anything. You'll never have anything good come out of your life because of the culture and the, the family that you come out of. That's the identity that you know, that you believe. But that is not at all the identity that God has for you. That is what the world has labeled you and placed you as but God has something so much more for you. And so when we can lean in and look at who these guys, who, what their names really were, because they sat together and they took a stand together and they walked into the fire together and God showed up. They said, even if, so there was a little bit of doubt there and there's gonna be moments that you just walk and have a little bit, God, I hope you show up. Man, I can tell you right now, June of 2010, that's where I was. God, I hope you show up. I hope you show up. I sat with the right people. I took a stand 
that I had to take. I stepped into my calling and I walked into that because I threw all the other labels that everybody else had given me and some that I gave myself to the side and began to ask God what he created me and who he created me to be. So their names were this. Shadrach, his name was actually Ananiah. And the worship team, you guys can go ahead and begin to make your way back up here. Shadrach's name was Ananiah, which means Yahweh is gracious. God is good. So he's the one. That's why he was the one that was like the leader, the positive one, the encouraging one. Meshach, I said he was the hood one. His name was Michelle, who's who is like Yahweh. There's no one else that's like my God, so try me. And Abednego, his name was Azariah, which means Yahweh has helped. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me for just a second. We're going to worship and then we're going to roll into a couple other moments. But some of you are in a season and you're in li- spots in life where you're literally wondering if God's going to show up. Some of you are living in seasons of life right now that you are living by everybody else's identity and label that's been placed upon you, but not even considering or looking at what God has called you and labeled you to be. You are a child of God. You are made in his image. Imago Dei is the theology behind it that we are made from the actual substance of who God is. Everything else he breathed into existence, but when he created us, he took something out of himself and he created us. Step out, step up into what God is calling you to be and calling you to do. Some of you, it's to actually show up and be something different and do something different. Some of you, it is to respond to Jesus and say, I need you to make you the boss, the savior, the rescuer of my life. Some of you, it's to step into the answer to the call to ministry. Some of you, it's to lead and to encourage your basketball team. Some of you, it's to, sit, it's to go out and it's to go sit with the kid that has nobody else around him and he needs a friend. Some of you, it's to go at home and just begin to lean into the word of God for a couple of minutes a day and watch God begin to change your heart in the way that you think and the way that you act but you got to find the right people for you to sit with because even if he doesn't show up, no, but he's going to. Even if he doesn't show up, I'm going to sit with the people that are going to get me through this time. Even if he's not going to show up, I'm going to take a stand because I know that he is going to show up and I know that he has shown up and I know that he will show up. And I know I'm shouting, but here's the deal then you're going to walk into a season where God has something so significant and great for you in the influential side, but you got to walk through some of the storms and know that he is faithful and know that he is good. So he can lead you and guide you. He's not putting you somewhere just so he can torture you and torment you. He's got something even stronger and greater for you, but you got to be available to that. You got to obey God the first time because delayed obedience is disobedience. And some of you may have to work backwards and you got to get the right name. I don't care what everybody else around you has said. I don't care what the label that's been put on you. I believe and I know and everybody else here in this room that you are a child of God and he died on the cross for your sins and he ascended into heaven because he has a purpose and a plan for every single one of you. But you get to make the choice to step into that. Watch your world flip upside down when you begin to let God do what only God can do in your life. Even if, mm, but he's going to. God, you're not here yet, I don't think, no, no. He's never late, because he's always on his time. He holds everything in the palm of his hand. So we, if we just go, we'll just do the second song, just do nothing else. We're going to lean into this for a moment. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Some of you were here last year in a moment like this. And you walked out Saturday night and Sunday morning, you wouldn't look any different. Some of you have been wrestling with this call to ministry thing, what God has in store for you. And you're running from it. Some of you are saying, I don't know where else to go. I don't know what else to do. 
Everybody, nobody thinks this is going to be for real because everything else in the past doesn't line up with the future. God is the one that holds the future. Let him begin to shape it and mold it for you. So every head bowed and every eye closed in here today. First thing is this. If you have not said yes to Jesus, you, you don't know who he is, you don't know what he has for you, but you believe in this moment, you're like, I need to know more of the fact that he died on the cross for my sins and he rose again. We got leaders across the room. You got youth pastors. Go and find them and say, hey, I need to make this declaration and life change to follow Jesus. But for everybody else in this room, sit with the right people, take a stand, walk in season that you may not want to walk into, but God is calling you into and get the right label. Don't take the worldly name that everyone else has placed upon you. Know what God has called you to be. Own it, value it, cherish it, and take pride in it. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray and we're going to worship, but these altars are open. And if you got something today that you got to lay down, come and pray and say, God, I'm yours. You got to pray for some new friends. God, I need, I need that real relationship. I need someone to encourage me. I need to get rid of the friends that I do have. And I don't know how to do, have that tough conversation. God, I, I, I know you're calling me to take a stand. Help me and show me the way to take a stand so I can walk and follow you. So Heavenly Father, God, I thank you. God, I thank you for this room. God, I thank you for your faithfulness and I thank you for your goodness. God, and I pray right now that, that these altars in this front would be a place where we can bow down before you and call on your name and say, God, you are the only one that I want to follow. God, let our path be guided and led by you for a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And God, whatever the stronghold or whatever the struggle is that these students and these leaders are facing today, God, that you begin to break down those chains and those bondages and the things in only ways that you can and they be laid at your feet and left in victory because you've already gone before us. So God, today we lay our brokenness at your feet. God, we lay our pride, we lay our shame, we lay our guilt. God, the poor choices, God, God, we lay our future in your hands. God, that you be magnified and be glorified. Father, I thank you for this moment. And we give you the glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.